In this session, we'll be looking at the AQA Chemistry Paper 2 from the year 2019. Water that is safe to drink contains dissolved substances. What do we call water that is safe to drink? And that would be potable water. Give the results of the test uh, if the water is pure. So the test for this is that we boil the water. And pure water will only boil at 100 degrees Celsius. Describe a method to determine the mass of dissolved solids in a 100 centimetres cubed sample of river water. To do this, first you would measure the mass of the container. Then you would measure 100 centimetres cubed of water and pour it into the container. After this, you heat the container of water until it's dry and only the solids remain. Then lastly, you determine the mass of the solids by taking away the mass of the container from the mass of solids and th A sample of river water contains 125 milligrams per decimeters cubed of dissolved solids. So that's our concentration. Calculate the mass of dissolved solids in 250 centimeters cubed of this sample. So that's our volume. And we've got to give our answer to two significant figures. So first of all, we've got to do our conversions. So for the concentration, um, instead of having 125 Micro, um, sorry, milligrams. To convert that into grams, we divide by a thousand, which would give us an answer of 0 0.125 grams per decimeter cubed. Then to change our volume, we would change 250 centimeters cubed into decimeters cubed, again by dividing by a thousand, so that would give us 0 0.25 um, decimeters cubed. Because concentration is mass divided by volume. To work out the mass, we can rearrange this and we would have concentration times volume. And if we put our numbers in, that means the mass must be our concentration, which is 0 0.125 grams per decimeters cubed, times by the volume, which is 0 0.25 decimeters cubed. And if we calculate that out, we get an answer of 0 0.03125. And then making sure we give our answer to two significant figures, our answer would be 0 0.031. A water company allows a maximum of 500 milligrams per decimeters cubed of sulfate ions in drinking water. A sample of drinking water contains 44 milligrams per decimeters of sulfate ions. Calculate the percentage of the maximum allowed mass of sulfate ions in the sample of drinking water. So we've got 44 milligrams out of the 500 milligrams per decimeter cubed that's allowed and then to turn that into a percentage we times by 100 we calculate that out we get an answer of 8 point this question is about atmospheric pollutants um, from fuels fuel burns in a car engine describe how oxides of nitrogen are produced in the car engine so here what happens is due to the high temperatures the oxygen and the nitrogen in the air react to form oxides of nitrogen Table 1 shows the carbon footprint produced during the manufacture and the use of three cars A, B and C. Evaluate the carbon footprint of the cars and we've got to use information from... Now looking at the data from Table 1 we can see that car A produces the least amount of carbon dioxide during manufacture whereas car C produces the most. We can see that car C produces the least amount of mass of carbon dioxide in driving in kilograms per kilometer, whereas car A produces the most. We can see that the total mass of carbon dioxide for driving 40,000 kilometers is least for car A and the most for car C. And we can see that the total mass of, of carbon dioxide for driving 100,000 kilometers is least for car A and most for car C. Therefore, overall, due to car A having the least amount of carbon dioxide mass during manufacture, driving 40,000 kilometers and driving 100,000 kilometers, it would have the smallest car. This question is about chromatography of food colorings. Um, food coloring is a formulation. What is a formulation? So a formulation is a mixture designed as a useful product.
Explain how paper chromatography separates dyes in, a food color, in food colorings. Do not give details of how to do the experiment. So, different dyes have different solubilities and due to this they will move up the paper at different speeds. Explain how the student can tell from the chromatogram that the food colouring contained more than one dye. So this would be because you would get different coloured dots in the same column. Explain how the student could use chromatography to identify unknown dyes in the food colouring. So you would test the unknown dye alongside the known dyes. You would compare the distances travelled by the known and the unknown dyes. And if the dots are the same distance um, as the known dye, that means the unknown dye must have that present. This question is about copper and fuels. Copper is extracted from low-grade ores by phytomining. Plants are grown on the low-grade soil and absorb the copper ore from the soil. Plants are then burnt and the ash is collected. The ash is then dissolved in acid to produce a copper compound solution and then we can use electrolysis to extract the copper. Another method of extracting copper from low grade um, ores is bioleaching. A solution of copper sulphate produced by bioleaching has a concentration of 0.319 grams per decimeters cubed. We've got the relative atomic masses of the copper, the oxygen and the sulphur and we need to calculate the number of moles of copper that can be produced from one decimeter cubed. So because the concentration is 0.319 grams per decimeters cubed, we know that in one decimeters cubed we are going to have 0.319 grams of the copper sulphate. Now, to work out the number of moles, moles is the mass divided by the molecular mass. So we know that the mass that we have is 0.319 grams in a decimeter. The molecular mass of copper sulphate is going to be the mass of one copper, which is 63.5 plus one sulphur, which the mass of sulphur is 32 plus the mass of four oxygens, so that's four times 16. And that would work out at 0 0.319 divided by 159.5, and that gives us an answer of 0 0.002. Copper is used as a catalyst. Figure 1 shows the reaction profile for a reaction with and without a catalyst. Um, how do the reaction profiles show that the catalyst does not affect the overall energy change for the reaction? So the correct answer here would be that both reactions start at the same energy level and end at the same energy level. Copper is a catalyst in a react is used in a reaction to produce ethanol from carbon dioxide. Ethanol is used as a fuel. Suggest why producing ethanol from carbon dioxide is sustainable. And it's sustainable because the amount of carbon dioxide that is used to produce the ethanol is the same as the amount of carbon dioxide that's given off when ethanol is combusted or burnt. Chemistry plays an important role in sustainable development. What is sustainable development? So sustainable development means that we have enough resources to meet the needs of our current generation but we're not compromising the needs of future generations. This question is about magnesium. A student investigated the rate of reaction between magnesium and hydrochloric acid. Um, figure, figure 2 shows the apparatus used. So what is the correct ionic equation for the reaction? So first of all, because we're using magnesium metal, that would not be an ion. So it's got to be one of these two as the correct answer. Now, because we're using hydrochloric acid, it's the H plus ions um, that would be reacting with the magnesium. And as we can see with this one, it's not an ionic equation. So the correct answer here would be here. And if we look just to make sure, Magnesium plus 2H plus ions makes Mg2 plus 
plus H2. And that all looks correct. So when we react magnesium with hydrochloric acid and we look at the ionic equation, the question is what happens to electrons? So this is our equation. And as we can see, the magnesium will transfer two electrons to each of the H plus ions to form Mg2 plus and H2. So electrons are transferred. Table two shows the results um, from a student. So this is with magnesium and hydrochloric acid. So we've got time in seconds, volume of gas produced, and we've got to plot data from the table. And So you need to make sure that all your points are plotted um, within half a small square. Describe the changes in the rate of reaction. So for this question, I would suggest that you um, label the different parts of the graph A, B and C. So from the graph, we can see that at point A, the gradient is the steepest, so the rate of reaction is the fastest. At point B, the gradient is less steep, so the rate has decreased or slowed down. And at part C, the graph is now horizontal, which means no more gas is being produced, so the reaction has stopped. Now we need to explain why the rate of reaction changes, and we need to give our answer in terms of the collision theory. The reaction decreases as the reacting particles are getting used up, so there are less particles remaining. Due to less particles, there are fewer collisions and are less frequent collisions. And the reactant will stop when one of the reactant particles are all used up. This question is about oxygen and sulfur dioxide gas. Give the test and results for oxygen gas. So you put a glowing splint near the test tube of oxygen gas and if the glowing splint relights, then it is oxygen gas. The reaction between oxygen and sulfur is at equilibrium. Some of the sulfur trioxide is removed. Explain what happens to the position of the equilibrium. So the equilibrium will shift to the right hand side to try and compensate for the decrease in concentration of sulfur trioxide. Sulfur dioxide is an atmospheric pollutant. Sulfur dioxide um, pollution is produced by reacting calcium oxide with sulfur dioxide to produce calcium sulfite. If we have seven grams of calcium oxide reacting with an excess of sulfur dioxide and we've got the relative atomic masses and we have to calculate the mass of calcium sulfite produced. So first of all, if we write our equation out, so the two that we are concerned with is seven grams of calcium oxide, how much calcium sulfite is going to be produced. So if we work out the molecular masses of the ones that we're concerned with, the molecular mass of calcium oxide, one calcium plus one oxygen is 56. The molecular mass of one calcium, one sulfur and three oxygens is 120. So that's our ratio to start with. Now we can work out how much one would produce by dividing each side on our ratio by 56. So 56 divided by 56 is 1, 120 divided by 56 is 2.143 to two decimal places. And then to work out how much 7 grams could give, we times the 1 by 7, which means we times the 2.143 by 7. So 7 grams then would give 15 grams of our calcium sulfite. This question is about hydrocarbons and crude oil. Hydrocarbon fuels that are produced from crude oil describe how crude oil separates into fractions and this is for So we would heat the crude oil, the shorter hydrocarbons will boil first and they will move to the top of the column. They condense there and are collected as their fraction. The longer hydrocarbons with higher boiling points will condense lower down the column because they have higher boiling points. So the fractions are collected due to their boiling points, lowest at the top and highest at the bottom. Then we've got two equations for combustion of butane. Why are different products form? So the main reason, if we look here, we've got different amounts of oxygen, which means we will get different products being formed because we have complete combustion and incomplete combustion. And then for the last part, we need to balance the equation. So first of all, we've got four carbons. So if we put a four in front of the carbons, 
Um, we've then got four oxygens and one more, that's five oxygens, but on this side we can't have five oxygens because it's in a multiple of two. So what we'll do now is we will double um, what we have to start with. So instead of having four, if we double this, which means we have eight carbons on this side and then eight carbons on the reacting side. And then if we look at our hydrogens, we now have 20 hydrogens on the reacting side. So to get 20 hydrogens on our product side, we put a 10 in front of the H2O. So we know that our carbons and our hydrogens are now balanced and now we've got to count our oxygens. So in this part we've got eight oxygens and in this part we have 10 oxygen so we've got 18 all together so if we put a nine here that would give us our 18 carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas describe the greenhouse effect in terms of interactions of short and long wavelength radiations with matter shorter wavelength radiation is emitted into the earth's atmosphere from the sun this is then absorbed and re-emitted by materials on the Earth. However, the re-emitted radiation is longer wavelengths. Now, these longer wavelengths radiations cannot get back through the atmosphere due to the greenhouse gases and become trapped near the Earth, so the average temperature around the Earth increases.